let's go on to the session. So I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So what is uh, remote sensing? Remote sensing is the technique of collecting the data without physical, without any physical contact with the object of uh, investigation. So it involves collecting the data about an uh, object or geographic area from a distant point using the remote sensing instrument. So these are all the components that are involved. So one thing is uh, we have the object on the earth uh, for which we need to uh, gather the information about and that is being done by using the satellites. So from the satellite we record some information and that is being transmitted back to the earth and we record it somewhere and then we do some analysis by using the specific softwares and then we get the information out of it. So that is what remote sensing is. The first two points are very crude definition just for your understanding the highlighted uh, in, uh, the highlighted point is the actual definition of remote sensing so the measurement or acquisition of information of some property of an object or a phenomenon it may be object or a phenomenon like flooding climate change forest fire volcanic eruption all this uh, phenomenon also by you by a recording device which is not in physical contact with the object but it is able to gather the information. So this was given by Colwell in 1997. And there are two types of remote sensing. One is the passive remote sensing and active remote sensing. So it is very important to understand what is the difference between these two. So the passive remote sensing is where the, the source of the energy is the sun. The energy from the sun interacts with the objects on the earth and uh, Objects on the earth also emit some radiation and it is being captured by the satellite and which is being transmitted through the ground station. But in case of active remote sensing, we don't have the sun as a source, but rather the satellite itself will transmit some incident radiation to the surface and it will interact with the object on the surface and then the radiation which is emitted back, we call that as the backscatter which is the back the backscatter will be recorded by this satellite and it will be transmitted to the ground station again. So that is active remote sensing. So I hope uh, this is very clear to everyone uh, and it was uh, uh, beautifully described in the video lectures as well. So, and what is the role of remote sensing? So why is it being used? So there are features on the earth like natural resources, and uh, there are many other features and uh, these features uh, undergo the change over time. For example, urbanization happens and uh, to track these changes, they must be monitored, mapped and analyzed. By using the remote sensing and GIS, we can keep track of these changes and we can uh, develop some management plans for better management of these resources so that we use it optimally. So some of the classic application is the land cover change, uh, which we do for uh, ma mainly for the urbanization as well as the water body, monitoring the water bodies and uh, deforestation also will make use of it. And second uh, application is the flood inundation mapping. We can uh, recently uh, you have heard about the Yamuna flooding and if you, have, uh, if you are in LinkedIn, you could have uh, seen some satellite images uh, people would have posted. So all these are through remote sensing only and vegetation health monitoring. This is related to the agriculture sector. And on the right side, I have mentioned the potential applications uh, uh, which are in the agriculture sector. There are n number of applications, similarly in the other sectors as well. So uh, now having seen about the, uh, what is remote sensing and its application, uh, what is the physical basis behind it? So some of the intuitive question, how do we see an object? So for this question, you can see the this figure on the right side. So the incident solar radiation from the sun is a incident on the object and the object reflects or scatters some of the radiation which is incident on it 
and it comes to our eye and our eye is able to see this in terms of the red blue and green composites so our eye is capable of seeing only rgb which is the visible spectrum so and that is how we are able to see the object so whatever object you are seeing you are seeing the presentation right now this is also a kind of remote sensing but our eye is doing it now in this what uh, the satellite also does the same and some other questions are like uh, why do the leaves look green and why does the chalk look white and why does the sky look blue at noon and reddish orange during the sunrise and sunset these are all some of the questions uh, which we need to understand and which we need to know the answer for to get the physical basis of remote sensing so the fundamental basis is the interaction of the electromagnetic radiation with the objects on the earth and what is the source the source here is the sun and we are going to talk only about the passive remote sensing as of now so going in detail so the electromagnetic radiation is the basic of uh, your physics just to brush up your basics it is generated whenever the electric charge is accelerated and it interacts with the objects on the earth in a unique way so each object uh, will interact in a unique way that's why we have different kinds of behavior depending on the property of the object and all the objects uh, which are above the absolute zero temperature produce and emit the electromagnetic radiation in proportion to their temperature so how much intensity uh, the object is uh, emitting that depends upon their temperature so this is the electromagnetic radiation it has two components one is the electrical field and another one is the uh, magnetic field and they both are they both are orthogonal to each other so these are all some of the basics which you need to remember and these two questions which i have listed here uh, is what you should always uh, think about in term, in remote sensing so how much an object emits the electromagnetic radiation based on its own temperature so this is the passive remote sensing then how much an object absorbs a radiation and reflects or emits back so this is kind of like a active remote sensing so these two questions we need to uh, keep in mind always when we are uh, analyzing something so and then moving little uh, to the further more into the basics so uh, these are all some of the basic definitions from your uh, physics so wavelength is the distance between the two consecutive crest or trough and it is typically measured in meters nanometers and micrometers and in remote sensing we'll be always uh, talking either about uh, uh, nanometers or micrometers uh, uh, at this point of time then we have the frequency frequency is the number of oscillations of the electromagnetic wave per unit time and its unit is hertz and the electromagnetic radiation uh, travels at the speed of the light in vacuum and uh, we have the speed of light 3 into 10 power 8 meter per second and the amplitude is the maximum height or intensity of the wave it determines the brightness of the light or the intensity of the radiation so this is the electromagnetic spectrum so here you can see from the left you have 10 uh, 10 square that is 100 meters from 100 meters all the way up to the gamma waves which is 10 to the power of minus 12 meters so this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum we have gamma waves x-rays and then ultraviolet and this is the small portion where our eye is uh, sensitive and uh, this is the region where we are seeing all the objects and moving further towards the left is the infrared then microwave and then the radio waves and uh, these are some of the places where different uh, signals are being used and uh, now we are breaking down into the uh, remote sensing specific uh, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum so which is uh, electromagnetic spectrum for satellite remote sensing so you have the ultraviolet region uh, that is less than 0.4 micrometers or 400 nanometers and then this is the visible spectrum where we are seeing that varies from 400 to 700 uh, micrometers approximately and then from 700 to 1000 is your near infrared band and you have the thermal band then you have the microwave band and the radio waves so we will be talking about this multispectral satellite remote sensing spectrum 
so this is the region where we are going to see most of the things uh, right now uh, i hope uh, everything is clear until this point in time uh, yes, is there any doubt i saw some messages okay yeah we are good to go yeah. are you discussing any question related to any question are you discussing this point uh like uh, how is it going to go is uh, the slides itself will have the uh, answers to some of the previous year questions and uh, based on what i am going to uh, take in these slides uh, they will be applying the concepts hello okay okay, okay sir can you show the question please questions uh, uh just yes, yeah just a minute Yeah, these are some of the previous year question. Uh, I'll be discussing this uh, towards the end of the lecture, uh, not right now. Uh, I hope this is okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll continue. So, what are the components that are involved in remote sensing? First, we have the source of the electromagnetic radiation. Then. we have the target object then we have platform and sensors that is the satellites from the satellite we'll get the raw data then raw data must be processed and we have two types of processing analog processing digital processing then from that we'll get the uh, products that is the from the analysis we'll be getting the products and we'll be applying it for our studies okay first we'll go through one by one so first is the source the source is the electromagnetic radiation and for passive remote sensing the sun is the um, primary source and we have the thermonuclear fission that is happening in sun and this emits the radiation which we call it as the insulation or the incident radiation and it uh, comes to the earth and in the earth the, we have the atmosphere it interacts with the atmosphere after interaction with the atmosphere it uh, interacts with the objects on the earth and the objects reflect absorb transmit depending on the properties and then it's being recorded by the satellite so the major ways of energy transfer we have uh, three types conduction convection and radiation and we also know from the physics that electromagnetic radiation uh, we have two models the wave model and the particle model so first we uh, will look into the wave model wave model is uh, coined by maxwell and which conceptualized the electromagnetic radiation as electromagnetic waves and here if you see for relatively longer wavelength the frequency is uh, less and for shorter wavelength the frequency is high so this is this inverse relationship uh, we need to remember and these are some of the basic equations uh, speed of the light is equal to lambda into frequency and uh, this third equation is the one which we should remember lambda is equal to c divided by frequency and uh, moving further from this uh, uh, we can characterize the um, energy of the electromagnetic radiation this is done by using the stefan boltzmann law which states that the total emitted radiation from a black body is proportional to the fourth power of its absolute temperature so sigma t to the power 4 sigma is the stefan boltzmann constant and the amount of energy emitted by the object such as sun or earth is a function of its temperature so depending on the temperature the energy that is emitted by a black body will change so we can see this from this figure so here you have sun so as the temperature is very high you can see the wavelength is shorter and it emits uh, the peak radiation is in the uh, visible region and we have the for uh, and for other uh, comparison we have the tungsten filament then we have red hot object and here we have our earth which is uh, temperature is approximately around 300 kelvin and the peak uh, this is the maximum uh, energy that is emitted by earth 
so here um, this is part of the uh, one of the question in the uh, assignment so as the temperature of the object increases the dominant wavelength shift towards the shorter wavelength and once we know the amount of energy that is being emitted by the black body we can determine what is the dominant wavelength that is lambda max so that is done by using the wain's displacement law so lambda max we have uh, lambda max is equal to k divided by t where k is a constant and uh, it is equal to 2898 micrometer kelvin and t is the absolute temperature in kelvin so for sun uh, if we want to find out what is the dominant wavelength at which it is emitting its radiation so lambda max is equal to uh, this constant divided by the temperature of the object which is equal to 0.48 micrometer so the dominant wavelength at which the sun is emitting is 0.48 micrometer similarly we can calculate this based on this graph we know what is the temperature we know what is the temperature of the earth and uh, if you want to calculate what is the dominant wavelength at which uh, earth is uh, emitting so what you have to do is you just have to divide it by 300 kelvin and you can find out what is the dominant wavelength i hope this is uh, this part is clear excuse me sir yeah so can you teach again this numerical this numerical yeah 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 okay so uh, in this uh, in this part what we have found is what is the amount of energy that is being emitted by the uh, source and now we are going to find out what is the dominant wavelength at which it is emitting so what is the peak wavelength at which it is emitting its radiation so for that we are using the wain's displacement law and this is the equation for the wain's displacement law k is a constant and it equals 2898 micrometer and t is the absolute temperature in kelvin so from this graph we can see the temperature is given in the kelvin so 6000 kelvin so lambda max is equal to this constant divided by the temperature will give you the dominant wavelength so similarly for any other object from this graph you can find out what is the dominant wavelength understood yes sir understood thank you so much yeah okay so uh, having uh, spoken about sun we should know uh, what are the components uh, in which it is emitting so 41 percentage is uh, emitted from the visible spectrum which is 0.4 to 0.7 micrometer and rest of the 59 percent is in the other regions that is the ultraviolet region thermal infrared and the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum but our human eyes are only sensitive to this visible region which is uh, blue green and red so whatever uh, image we are viewing it will be in true color composite that is the r g and b but uh, we are getting information from the remote sensing uh, satellites in uh, thermal band in nir band so if you see it will be just a black and white color so how do we visualize it our eyes cannot uh, differentiate much information from the black and white image so for that what we use is we use a false color composite in which what we will do is in place of uh, red or blue or green we will be importing some other band so instead of red band we will have nir near infrared band so the near infrared will appear red in color in our image so this we will uh, you will understand when we uh, go into some of the demonstrations uh, which i may sh show in the subsequent lectures right now what you need to understand is uh, human eyes only sensitive to the visible spectrum and rest of the spectrum we will be viewing it in a false color composite so now we have seen the wave model next is the particle model particle model was uh, found by einstein in which uh, light interacts with electrons and it has a different character and uh, it behaves as if uh, it is composed of many individual bodies called as photons and uh, which carry the particle property such as energy and momentum and when the uh, energy interacts with matter it is useful to describe it as discrete uh, discrete packets of energy or quanta and later uh, this uh, 
theory was acknowledged and then Niels Bohr and Max Planck uh, they uh, proposed the quantum theory of electromagnetic radiation. So this is the quant the particle model the quantum theory. So in this uh, the energy is transferred in discrete packets called the quanta or photons and the relationship between the frequency of radiation expressed by the wave theory is given by this equation. So Q is the energy or the quantum quantum of energy that is equal to h into frequency where h is the Planck's constant and uh, it has a value of 6.626 into 10 power minus 34 joule second and u is the frequency of radiation. So now we know what is uh, frequency. Frequency can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, speed of uh, light and wavelength from the uh, particle model. So essentially we are combining uh, both. So quantum of energy is equal to h into c by lambda. So now for any given wavelength, so let's say the wavelength uh, of red is around uh, uh, 0.7 micrometer. So if you want to find out what is the energy uh, that is corresponding to the red band, all you have to do is substitute the Planck's constant, substitute the speed of light divided by the wavelength of the red band. So then you will find the uh, what is the quantum of energy that is associated with the red band. And if you see from this equation, energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, the lower will be the energy content and the more difficult it is to detect it. So this we will understand when we talk about the spatial resolution of uh, satellite. So right now you just keep in mind that energy of uh, energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So next coming to the satellites, sensors and orbits, uh, you would have uh, seen some of the images uh, which uh, in the video lectures as well. So we have three types, on ground, uh, this is used for calibration purposes and for some uh, field studies also. Then aerial measurements, we have film and scanners uh, through aircrafts and then we have the satellite. So we have orbital platform, suborbital platform and the sensors are at altitude of h above the ground level and beta or phi whichever you call it uh, it is the instantaneous field of view that is uh, perpendicular to the uh, satellite so this is a perpendicular line and the satellite is viewing a particular uh, area and that area is uh, at an uh, the field of view is at an angle of uh, beta and uh, the diameter or the distance that it covers on the field is the diameter of the ground projected instantaneous field of view. So this is one of the basic uh, drawing. Uh, uh, we will be looking at uh, more detailed drawing in the upcoming slides. And uh, talking about the orbital platform, uh, we have uh, two types of orbits. One is the polar orbit and another one is the satellite orbit. So polar orbit or sun synchronous orbit. So it is uh, going from north to south and it crosses the equator at the same day. Some example satellites are uh, Landsat and IRS. They both are polar orbits and the altitude is around 700 to 900 kilometers. So if you see here. So this is how the uh, uh, sun synchronous orbit uh, uh, does and uh, if you see um, the coverage so the satellite uh, these are the the red color lines are the coverage area so the center line of the satellite movement which is called as the ground track of the polar satellite and then we have another type of uh, satellite uh, which is the sun synchronous uh, or geosynchronous uh, that is geostationary so it is uh, it does only one orbit per day and example is insat and uh, geostationary uh, optical earth satellite and its altitude is around uh, 35000 to 36000 kilometer above the uh, earth and it is primarily used for weather and communication so you can see the difference uh, between both the satellites so this geostationary satellite will look at only one particular area and it will keep uh, rotating same as the approximately as the speed of the earth 
from east to west so both the satellites uh, have different purposes and uh, it is essential to know the difference between uh, these two satellites so this is the diagram detailed diagram which i was talking about uh, uh, in the uh, previous two uh, previous uh, before last two slides so we have a sensor and uh, perpendicular to this sensor uh, if we draw a line and it hits the uh, ground level so that point is called as the nadir point and the uh, this satellite is moving in uh, this direction and uh, the imaginary line uh, perpendicular to that sensor is called as the nadir line and this uh, field of view the dotted lines uh, you are seeing here this dotted lines are the instantaneous uh, field of view so at a particular uh, time it is uh, looking perpendicularly down to the earth and uh, the entire width this uh, this dotted line and this dotted line it is called as the swath swath means the width of coverage of the particular satellite so at a particular time it has a coverage of uh, this much distance and it is moving in uh, this direction and uh, if you see here this is the instantaneous field of view that is perpendicular to the down and uh, the satellite has a capability like the uh, the sensor can be rotated uh, in some of the satellites like modis uh, modis is a, a sensor in satellite um, it has the ability to rotate its uh, view to the left and right of its uh, entire swath so it is called as the off nadir so it is it does not look perpendicularly downwards but uh, it looks uh, some at some inclination uh, towards the uh, at some inclination with respect to the uh, nadir so in that way the images that are being recorded the pixels that are being recorded here will not be square in square in shape but rather it will be in the shape of a rectangle so that is the major difference so here we need to remember field of view instantaneous field of view what is nadir what is off nadir and what is swath so all these uh, properties will be uh, displayed in the uh, website of the satellite product which you are looking at you just need to go through the website so if you want you can go through the landsat 8 you can just go through the website and you can see uh, what are these uh, parameters and next is the uh, so now we have seen how the satellite is uh, collecting the data and these are the data formats which were discussed in the lectures as well and uh, major is uh, jpeg format tiff format and uh, it can also be opened in matlab or python you just have to uh, open this uh, raster file it will have a array of recorded values and uh, after the data types we have the resolution this is uh, this is the very important uh, which you need to understand spatial resolution is the size of the pixel we are talking about very crude definition i have given here spectral resolution is the bandwidth and number of bands temporal resolution is the frequency how frequent uh, you are getting the images and radiometric resolution is the precision of uh, data acquisition and storage so we'll go through so first before going into the resolution you should know uh, that uh, the data is stored in terms of uh, array and we have number of bands let's say blue band red band green band near infrared something like that and it has a range of brightness values here it is varying from 0 to 255 this is just a example how the data is being stored and it is a multi spectral image so coming to the spatial resolution so spatial resolution uh, is the smallest uh, angular or linear separation between two objects that can be resolved and as a thumb rule uh, whenever uh, they are designing the sensors so nominal spatial resolution of the remote sensing system should be less than one half of the size of the feature measured in its smallest dimension so it depends on the purpose of the study so uh, whether you are going to uh, monitor some some process which is very important uh, and uh, you need very fine data such as moderation migration of the river channel that requires a very high resolution data because we need, we are going to track the changes of the river uh, over a period of time and for that we need high resolution uh, data 
and as you move from left to right you can see the same area with the different uh, resolution so this is 30 meter by 30 meter this is 100 meter by 100 meter and this is by 300 meter by 300 meter so this is the uh, uh, spatial resolution now coming to the spectral resolution that is the bandwidth and the number of bands so it refers to the number and dimension or width of specific uh, wavelength intervals in the electromagnetic spectrum to which a sensor is sensitive so we have two types one is multispectral and another one is hyperspectral so first is the multispectral i'll describe about the multispectral so you have different bands red band these are the different bands which we have uh, and then if we plot the it is sensing some uh, image and you got the data and if you plot it it will look something like this so here they have plotted it as a bar graph but more appropriately you have to plot it as a line plot and on the left side if you see you have the hyperspectral imaging so here uh, in multispectral red band is only a specific uh, wavelength let's say 0. Uh, uh, 6 to 0 0.7 is the red band but in hyperspectral within the 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 band you can further have subdivisions let's say 0 0.6 to 0 0.62 0 0.62 to 0 0.64 within a particular band you will have n number of divisions and you will have n number of bands from and if you plot it you will get a continuous uh, plot like this so what we need to remember is that in multispectral uh, the bands are not continuous they have they are discrete bands because they cannot be the sensors cannot be made with uh, such high precision uh, you can only make up to a certain level and the precise way of stating the bandwidth is to look at the full width at half maximum so you would have seen this diagram already so you have the <coughs> peak intensity and we are seeing the 50 percentage of that intensity and whatever is the width at this 50 percentage that that particular width is what we call as the bandwidth so here i have uh, described for one example so bandwidth is uh, lambda 2 minus lambda 1 so it is 0 0.8 minus 0 0.7 so the bandwidth is uh, 0 0.1 micrometer and the central wavelength is uh, 0.75 where it has the maximum intensity so why uh, we do not uh, go further because uh, in these uh, areas uh, the sensor is not that sensitive of course it is capturing some information but it is not uh, that sensitive so all we want is uh, uh, the place where we get more information so that is how we describe the bandwidth so next is the temporal resolution which is the frequency of coverage so how often the sensor records the imagery of a particular area so this is essentially to track the changes in the earth over the time so in this uh, uh, when we talk about temporal resolution we talk about the revisit period of a satellite so what is the revisit period suppose you are uh, suppose a satellite is monitoring india today after how many days it will come to the same location to monitor the same place so landsat has 16 days sentinel 2 has 10 days and modis has two days of uh, reusage period and final thing is the radiometric resolution it is the precision of uh, data acquisition and storage so the sensor uh, is sensitive to different uh, uh, strength of the electromagnetic radiation uh, that is emitted from the target and if you see here uh, this is one bit resolution where you have uh, only two levels you have only black and white and if you increase the resolution to two bit you see much more detail and if you increase it further to two power eight this is 256 levels you can see much more details that is uh, visible so as you increase the number of bits that much information you will be able to get so uh, very crude understanding is the number of gray shades that a sensor can resolve so it is a very crude definition of uh, radiometric resolution so uh, one thing we need to understand that uh, we cannot have a sensor that is uh, uh, very good in all the resolutions because uh, it has its own uh, limitations so if you want uh, so there is a trade off between all the resolutions and different uh, sensors are being designed 
so a spatial resolution typically comes at the cost of reduced coverage area so if you want to have a high spatial resolution the altitude or at which the area is being monitored must be less and uh, it takes a lot of time to um, come to the same point so what you will have is uh, you will have a high resolution data but your revisit period of the satellite will be very very high so you will not be able to track minor changes that is happening within a short span of time and second is the spectral resolution so increasing the spectral resolution requires uh, complex and expensive sensors and designing is uh, also difficult and temporal resolution so this is again with respect to the altitude so sensor with high temporal resolution may have low spatial resolution because uh, uh, the satellite will be much higher altitude and rapid revisit time can result in small areas being covered in each image potentially sacrificing the level of detail so if the temporal resolution is high your spatial resolution will be less and vice versa and radiometric resolution again this is similar to the spectral resolution so if you have a very high radiometric resolution the amount of data amount of time involved in processing the data is very very high and you need extremely high computational uh, requirements so this is a image uh, uh, which is taken from uh, textbook jensen uh, it's a very good textbook so you can see um, for different purposes what is the nominal spatial resolution and what is the temporal resolution for example if you want to uh, uh, do the land use land cover analysis uh, minimum spatial resolution that is required is somewhere between 1 meter to 100 meter resolution and the temporal resolution between 1 to 10 years so people uh, uh, if you uh, search some uh, land use land cover change in google you can uh, get the uh, multi decadal land use land cover changes this kind of uh, journal articles you can get so for every 10 years what is the change in the land use and land cover so that kind of uh, studies require this kind of uh, uh, this much uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution and for weather prediction you have the uh, GOEA satellite you can see we need uh, for weather prediction we need it is essential that the we get as uh, frequent as possible so your temporal resolution is very less but what happens uh, your temporal resolution is less it is further away from the orbit obviously your spatial resolution will be high so whatever climate data for example the reanalysis data whatever you are going to use for the climate change studies so that will be at a very high resolution minimum it will start from uh, 2.5 kilometers and it can go up to 10 kilometers 25 kilometers in range one example is ecm wf that is european climate weather forecasting reanalysis data that has a spatial resolution of uh, 25 kilometers so i hope it, everything is clear until this point in time hello understood sir yes sir yeah okay so next is the uh, how the satellite is storing the information so we have the aerial photography uh, it is just a plain photograph and uh, coming to the multispectral scanner we have the uh, scanning mirror and it records the radiation that is emitted from the target object and it is stored in different bands so nir red green blue all these are uh, discrete uh, detectors and the, whatever the uh, radiation that is emitted from the surface is stored in each of this band and next is the uh, push broom sensor so it is uh, it stores the data in terms of uh, linear arrays next is the whisk broom sensors we have a rotating mirror and it uh, stacks the end bands in this form so it is a uh, continuous and here it is uh, discrete so you have blue green red and then ir next similarly you have a hyperspectral uh, imaging so it is n bands in n dimensions 
So number of bands are like 100 bands, 250 bands you will get. Whereas Landsat is having only around uh, uh, 8 to 10 bands uh, if I'm not wrong. <clears throat> and then here is the here is how the uh, digital cameras uh, store the data in terms of uh, discrete arrays uh, in different uh, bands. So now we talked about the source, how it is, uh, how the data is being stored. Next, uh, what we are going to talk about is how the electromagnetic radiation is interacting with the tar uh, target object. So for that, we need to know, uh, we need to understand the basic again, refraction, reflection, scattering and absorption. So refraction is the bending of the light uh, and uh, we have the index of refraction. It is the ratio of uh, the speed of the light in the vacuum to the speed of the light in the other medium and it gives the index and it uh, describes the optical density of the substance and we also have the Snell's law to calculate the <coughs> angle at which the uh, ray is refracted. So when the, so imagine uh, this uh, Outer medium is the space and uh, this medium is the atmosphere. So space is vacuum and the speed of the light is high and it comes to the denser medium which is the Earth's atmosphere. Obviously it is going to interact with the atmosphere and uh, it is going to refract. So this is the first way uh, in which it is going to interact with our atmosphere. So in uh, after uh, interacting with the atmosphere, it uh, comes to the earth surface interacts with the objects on the surface of the earth and some amount of the incident uh, radiation is uh, will be reflected back because of the uh, surface uh, smoothness and the reflective property so here we have um, two types of uh, reflect reflectance one is a specular reflectance and another one is diffuse reflectance so specular reflectance is uh, when the incident radiation is equal to the amount uh, intensity of the exit radiance. So whatever comes in is be being basically reflected. But in reality, not all the surfaces are uh, perfect specular reflector. We always have some deformations. So the amount of incident radiant energy will be reflected dominantly, dominantly in one direction, but it will also have reflection in other directions as well. So that is the um, near perfect specular reflector. It is smooth, but it is not a perfect specular reflector. So second one is the diffuse reflection. So all the surface on the earth, uh, all the objects on the earth will uh, will have a, uh, most of the objects will have the diffuse reflection. So here uh, the distortions of the surface relative to the wavelength of the incident energy is very high. So what it will do is it will reflect in all possible directions. So here we have a Lambertian surface which is a perfect diffuse reflector. So we have an incident radiation and whatever it is reflecting on all the directions, the magnitude of this reflection in all the direction will be equal. That is the Lambertian surface. But Again, in reality, uh, not all surfaces are uh, Lambertian surface. So we have a uh, incident radiation. It will dominate uh, dominantly re uh, reflect in one direction, in and in other directions also we will have the reflections. So this is the diffuse reflection. Is this clear? <coughs> yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So. So next is scattering. Uh, this we would have studied in uh, basic physics itself. So it differs from the reflection that uh, direction of the direction in which it is going to uh, go is uh, unpredictable. So it can go in any direction. And scattering is a function of uh, wavelength of the incident uh, radiant energy and the size of the molecules or particles that it is interacting with. So we have three types of scattering. One is Rayleigh scattering, Mie scattering and uh, non-selective scattering. So Rayleigh scattering occurs when the diameter of the particle is much, much smaller than the wavelength of the incident uh, 
electromagnetic radiation. So here uh, the amount of scattering is inversely related to the fourth power of the radiation's wavelength. So if you see in this graph, so on the x-axis we have the visible spectrum 0.4 to 0.7. So it is essentially starting from blue to uh, red and you can see the intensity of the scattered light. So blue is scat scattered much more higher than the red. So if you remember the questions uh, which I uh, initially asked, so why does the sky look blue? at noon because blue light is completely scattered at noon and during the sunset what happens is the light from the sun has to travel a longer distance and blue is already scattered so rest of the uh, wavelength that is remaining is of red orange and this later part of this uh, spectrum only so that is why your sky is appearing reddish orange during the sunrise and sunset so here you can see the blue light is scattered 16 times more than the uh, near infrared light. So that is towards the end of the spectrum. So next is the me scattering. So here the particles are much uh, bigger than the uh, particles uh, which are responsible for the Rayleigh scattering. And these particles are uh, spherical in shape and uh, it's uh, uh, the diameter of the particle varies from uh, 0 0.1 to 10 micrometer uh, in diameter. So up to that particular uh, diameter, so all the particles uh, will undergo the mean scattering. So for visible light, water vapor, dust and other particles, few tens of a micrometer to several micrometers are main scattering agents. And pollution also contributes to beautiful sunsets and sunrise. So uh, if you see uh, in cities, uh, you will, if you see in the evening, you will have a lot of pollution. So because of the pollution, sometimes the sky will appear pinkish in color or purple in color. So that is because of the me scattering, because of the pollutants that scatter the electromagnetic radiation. And in non-selective scattering, all the wavelengths are essentially scattered, irrespective of what the wavelength is, either, either it is blue or either it is red, everything is scattered. And that is why the water droplets which make up the clouds and fog, all these are appearing white because the entire spectrum is scattered and all that is left is only the white color. So this is the reason why the uh, clouds are appearing white because it has the water droplet and it is undergoing non-selective scattering. So now we saw uh, scattering, the final thing is the absorption. So absorption is the process by which the radiant energy is absorbed and converted into other forms of energy. And uh, atmosphere has a lot of uh, gases and uh, these gases essentially interact with the electromagnetic radiation and they absorb the uh, wavelengths of particular uh, uh, and they absorb the radiation of particular wavelengths. So we will see how that is done, how that is being, uh, how that affects the remote sensing. So the cumulative effect of absorption by various constitutions can cause the atmosphere to close down. That is, uh, everything will be absorbed in certain regions of the spectrum. And in some regions, it will transmit some amount of energy and it will be modified a little bit. And uh, these uh, windows where the electromagnetic radiation is transmitted, they are called as atmospheric windows. So if you see here, if you see for water, so the white regions are the regions where it is uh, transmitting and if you see the final image, the this is combination of everything. So N2O nitrous oxide is uh, having uh, absorbing in this particular wavelength. Your ozone and oxygen is absorbing the entire uh, uh, ultraviolet region and uh, near uh, towards the later part of the spectrum also carbon dioxide and water so if you add all these things up you will get this uh, final uh, gra final uh, image that is the atmospheric uh, windows so you can see uh, from 0 to 0 0.3 essentially uh, we cannot sense anything because everything is uh, either reflected because everything is absorbed and 0.32 
0.7 you have atmospheric good atmospheric window that is in the visible region and uh, near uh, 1 micrometer you have windows similarly you have windows uh, in these places so the white patches are the places where we can uh, record some data which is reflected back from the earth surface so and uh, the same thing is being represented in terms of uh, this uh, graph so you have the solar radiation and you have the wavelength so this white portions are the places where you can essentially capture some data so let's go on uh, move on to some of the terminologies uh, first is the radiant flux uh, whatever we call as flux it will have with respect to time so the time rate of flow of energy onto off or through a surface is called the radiant flux and it is measured in watts and we have this radiation budget equation so phi of i lambda that is the total amount of radiant flux in specific wavelength incident on the terrain so the incident radiation is uh, undergoing reflection absorption and transmission so if you put together you will get the incident radiation and next thing what you should remember is uh, irradiance Irradiance is the amount of radiant flux that is incident on a surface per unit area. So, we are not uh, talking about a point object, we are always talking in terms of area. So, we should represent uh, the radiant flux in terms of uh, uh, the surface area. So, you have the irradiance. Irradiance means that is incident on the object. Exitance means the amount of uh, radiant flux that is leaving the surface per unit area of the surface. Is this clear? Hello? Yes, sir. Okay. Next thing is radiance. So, what we are essentially measuring in the remote sensing. So, all our sensors record radiance, which is uh, the radiant flux per unit solid angle leaving an extended source in a given direction per unit projected area in that direction and it is measured in watts per meter per steradian. So, here extended source does not mean the uh, source of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here the source means the object that has a finite dimension and it emits radiation from the surface. We are talking about the object here, the target object. It is not the electromagnetic uh, radiation source. So, uh, let's say if our sensor is fixed in uh, this position and uh, it is going to measure the radiation from this particular surface. So it is at an angle, uh, it is at an angle theta and we are going to measure perpendicular to the sensor's orientation. So if your sensor plane is uh, somewhat here, uh, so here you have a sensor and uh, this is the per normal to the uh, point how the sensor is viewing. So, we are going to record something uh, on this. Uh, here, there is the sensor. So, uh, we have the radiation that is coming from this surface, but it is at some angle. So, what we are going to do is we are going to project it perpendicular to the direction of its viewing. So, that projected area is a cos theta. And since it is coming from an area, we have a band of uh, radiation that is coming in. So that is why we are defining solid angle. So this solid angle we are defining because we are measuring a band and this band is uh, increasing. So near to the source this band will be short and as you as it comes near the sensor it will basically expand like a cone. So that is why we are uh, uh, introducing a solid angle. So what we will do is we will measure this uh, radiant flux per unit solid angle so that it is kind of like normalized and then divided by the projected area. So that will give you this radiance. So all our satellites are recording this radiance in the sensor and we will process this radiance to get the surface reflectance. Uh, is everyone, uh, did everyone understand this concept? Hello. Yes, 
So we have a yeah. So our sensor is going to measure uh, the reflectance from this particular object. So it is not a pointed object. So it is not a single point. It has some area. And uh, if our sensor is placed in uh, this direction, it is at an angle theta. It is at some angle theta. Hello. Uh, can you please mute yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> so it is at an angle theta. But uh, what we are doing is we are going to measure in a direction perpendicular to this uh, orientation. So this is the uh, angle at which the sensor is looking. We are going to measure perpendicular to this particular orientation. So we are projecting this area onto the perpendicular plane which we define. And this band keeps increasing like a cone. And we define this band with a solid angle omega. So the radian flux that is emitted from this surface is divided by this solid angle per unit solid angle divided by the projected area. So we are getting the radians. I have an answer. <clears throat> yeah, tell me. Hello. Understand, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So now we saw the terminologies. Now let us see what are all the difficulties that we have in the uh, interaction of uh, electromagnetic radiation with the uh, target object. So we have the source and it is emitting the radiation E0. This line is essentially our atmosphere. And uh, here we have our uh, satellite in the outer space. And we are going to measure the reflectance from this particular object. So right from the incidence, so we have path 1, uh, then path 2, 3, 4 and 5. So we will be looking at uh, what these paths are. So path 1 is the incident radiation that is uh, interacting with the atmosphere and then directly incident on the object. And we are interested in knowing uh, what is the angle at which it is uh, incident on the object that is defined by the solar zenith angle. And uh, this uh, solar zenith angle and all the other parameters will be available in the metadata of the data which you are going to download. Next, path 2. Path 2, uh, when the incident radiation is uh, interacting with the, after interaction with the atmosphere, comes into the, uh, comes inside your atmosphere, uh, we have the dust particles, we have the other uh, small, small gaseous molecules. So, what it will do is, it will scatter. So, this scattering, we call it as diffuse sky irradiance. And sometimes, the light that is scattering from these particles can go to our sensor also. So you can see this path 2 is going towards the sensor and it will also be recorded. So this is path 2. Next coming to path 3. So whatever the radiation that is being scattered, this scattered light can also come and interact with our target object and from this target object again it will be recorded in our satellite image. Next is the path 4. So you will have some other uh, object next to your target object and solar radiance will be incident on this object also and from this surface also you have some uh, outgoing radiation and sometimes what will happen is uh, this also will go directly to your satellite and that will also be recorded. And path 5. So whatever the radiation that is uh, coming and interacting with the neighboring object, it can also contribute. So let's say you have some uh, shiny surface here that is capable of reflecting. So it will illuminate this particular area and because of that brightness, this target object also will uh, get some additional brightness and this will also be recorded here. So 
what this path one to five, what we are saying, everything is being uh, termed as LP. So I will say what is LP. So just remember, all these are the unwanted radiation, unwanted unwanted radiance or the reflectance that is being recorded by the remote sensing system. But our object of interest is only this. So what will happen is whatever we are recording will not be from this alone, but the summation of all the other disturbances uh, which I have explained. So our main uh, target is to measure this LT and keep LP as minimum as possible. So that is what uh, uh, we need to keep in uh, mind. So LS is the total radiance that is measured at the sensor which is a summation of LT that is the total radiation from the target this is what we are interested in and LP is the total radiance from the path this is the unwanted radiation and we should keep it to a minimum level and that will be taken care by the uh, sensors by calibration. So if we integrate all this uh, radiation that is coming from the surface what we will get is the total sorry this equation is wrong it should be lt is equal to ls uh, ls is equal to lt plus lp but we are interested in uh, this lt only and this lt is expanded something uh, like this so this is the incident radiation and it is going the transmittance that is refraction at the atmosphere so we have the uh, since the uh, right is refracting it is going to change its direction so we have the theta and then ed is the diffuse sky irradiance because of the scattering that happens in the because of the gaseous molecules and the rho is the reflectance <clears throat> so we are going to uh, we are interested in knowing what is this lt so um, now let's say that uh, this everything is taken care of you have uh, uh, taken care of this uh, LP and then your satellite is in position and you are going to record the data in different bands. So once you get the data and then you plot it across the wavelength and the percentage reflectance, what you are going to get is uh, this kind of uh, profile. For each material, the behavior is different because different materials have different uh, temperature and because of the temperature variation it's going to behave differently so you can see uh, for grass uh, 0.4 is blue and uh, 0.6 is green then 0.7 to 0.8 is red then 0.8 to 0.9 here the near infrared will come so that is in the thermal range near infrared uh, so you can see the behavior of the grass so in blue, the reflection is very less. As it moves towards the green, the reflection starts increasing. It has uh, some percentage of reflection. Again, it goes down in the red. And once the NIR band starts to come, your vegetation will have the highest reflectance. So that is the property of grass. Uh, it is capable of reflecting the highest in the near infrared band. So let's say you have water. So in the water, you can see uh, this is this last line is for the water. So essentially in blue band, the reflection is less. And uh, here in green band, it is uh, the highest. And uh, towards the NIR band, completely absorbed. So water will absorb everything in almost everything in the near infrared and it will appear black in color. Whereas in the other bands, it will uh, have some amount of brightness. So your green has some brightness value, but in the near infrared region, it is completely absorbed. So similarly for concrete, you can see uh, it is almost a constant uh, profile across all the bands and you have for the uh, different uh, materials. So these are some of the things uh, which are commonly encountered in the uh, cities that is urban and uh, suburban phenomena. So and uh, this is only for the visible range I have uh, put here. So this is the entire spectrum. So you can see how the water is behaving. Uh, this last line, I don't know whether it is visible to you. Uh, 
here 400 uh, is the blue band and uh, towards the infrared band it, it is completely absorbed and it becomes zero and uh, you can see the uh, centipede grass uh, see in green near the green band it has some amount of reflection but as it crosses the red band that is 700 nanometers the it starts peaking up and it is it is having the highest reflectance in the uh, near infrared band so these curves are called as the spectral reflectance curves or the spectral signature but so remember i have uh, told about the um, uh, multispectral and hyperspectral so if you have a hyperspectral data you can get plots like this but what we are going to deal with is multispectral data so this is one of the plots which i made uh, for my course uh, in remote sensing uh, at iit madras so this is from one of the assignments which we did so for different uh, uh, land cover water fallow is nothing but uh, agriculture area without crops and uh, vegetation urban that is the concrete so you can see this uh, digital number values uh, these are from landsat 8 level 2 surface reflectance data don't worry about all these terminologies we will discuss in detail uh, in the forthcoming lectures and uh, these are uh, reflectance data scaled up this is actually scaled up uh, your reflectance varies from between 0 to 1 only but here it is uh, scaled up by 10000 uh, just to make the range uh, visible otherwise the, your entire image will be like dark and dark that is why it is being uh, scaled up and i have plotted for band 1 to band 4 band 1 is your blue band that band 2 is uh, uh, green then red then the near infrared so you can see the behavior of uh, uh, the water so blue band it is less in uh, green band it is higher and then it starts decreasing further and further and your vegetation has a very sharp peak at the NIR band and similarly concrete has again a constant profile and your uh, current fallow it is not a completely soil it also has some vegetation but it is not agriculture so if it is agriculture with the dense cropping it will have this green color profile but if it is fallow land but it still some it still has some uh, plants in it uh, mixed with soil with the less density of uh, plants it will have a uh, increasing profile like this so these are some of the uh, uh, i'll stop my uh, lecture in this uh, i have not covered the uh, source of error and the correction in this lecture because next week also you have uh, uh, lectures on source of error and its uh, corrections so i'll cover the entire thing in uh, one lecture uh, so these are some of the textbooks uh, so most of the images uh, which you have seen in this particular presentation is taken from this Jensen textbook and for advanced uh, uh, things which is going to come up in this course you can refer these two textbooks as well and 